tampering with the evidence. Missionaries want you to believe in their New Testament and that their messianic claims about Jesus are supported by the Tanakh, our Jewish Bible. To examine the believability of these claims, let us begin by examining how accurately the missionaries and the writers of the New Testament use Jewish scripture. A careful study of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, reveals how often deception is used to build the case for Jesus. Since the writers of the New Testament wanted to paint Jesus into the Tanakh as often as possible, we will see just how far they go to make this work. Two key lessons to learn from this video presentation are, Judaism bases its beliefs on a comprehensive reading of the entire Bible. Every verse must be taken into account in order to get the true picture. Missionaries do not and cannot quote every verse. They ignore major sections of the Tanakh because many verses contradict the picture they are trying to fabricate. Would their literature ever include verses such as, God is not a man that he should lie, Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, or do not put your trust in princes nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no salvation, Psalm 146, verse 3. By the way, Jesus is often referred to as the Son of Man. Number two, a key lesson is every prophecy that the missionaries cite from the Tanakh is either mistranslated or misrepresented, taken out of context, or just made up. Let me quote two passages from the New Testament to set the stage. In every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Book, New Testament book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 18. And another, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might win them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being without law to God, but under the law to Christ. That I might win them that are without law. To the weak, became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. In these two New Testament passages, the Apostle Paul reveals his willingness to say whatever it takes to get people to believe in Jesus. Here he set the precedent of the end justifying the means for all future missionaries. We now read several examples that show how much the missionaries tamper with the evidence. For instance, the order of the Tanakh. A key insight into Christian manipulation begins with something as simple as the order of the Tanakh. As we know, the words Tanakh is an acrostic formed by the first letter of the names of the three sections of the Jewish scriptures. Torah, the five books of Moses, Nevi'im, prophets, and Ketuvim, writings. The Tanakh was canonized in roughly 500 BCE, over 800 years before the New Testament by the men of the Great Assembly, who obviously placed great significance on the order of the books. The Church sought to graft the New Testament onto the Tanakh and thereby create its own Bible. Many changes in the translation and the order of the books were incorporated to make the church's creation appear to be a better flow from our book into theirs. This chart, which is available on page 17 of our transcript that you can download by clicking on the link below this video, reveals how the church has rearranged almost all our sacred scriptures. The church obviously felt it had license as editors of our Tanakh to rearrange its order. As we will see, they used this license to change other things as well. The new order meant that our book could no longer be called the Tanakh and required a new name. Therefore, they called it the Old Testament to be superseded by the New Testament. The church rearranged the books of the Tanakh to end with Malachi rather than Second Chronicles. Malachi allowed 
for a smoother transition into the New Testament book of Matthew, since Second Chronicle, Chronicles ends with an upbeat message for the Jews. There, King Cyrus of Persia gives the Jews permission to return from exile to rebuild their land and their temple. In typical fashion, the church tried to avoid highlighting hopeful messages about the future of the Jews, especially because we rejected Jesus. So, while the last chapter in the Jewish Bible concludes with, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth has the Lord God of heaven given me, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 23. In contrast, Malachi in the Christian Old Testament ends with, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. He will turn back to God the hearts of the fathers with their sons and the hearts of the sons with their fathers, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. That's from Malachi chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. For the church, this is a great lead into the New Testament story of John the Baptist, who they allege to be Elijah the prophet, heralding the Messiah, Jesus. However, in the New Testament book of John, chapter 1, verse 21, John the Baptist actually denies being Elijah. Let's look at a few examples of missionary proof texting. The New Testament repeatedly claims that Jesus fulfilled biblical messianic prophecies. The Jewish position is that he did not fulfill any of them, and that all attempts to make him appear to have done so come from misquoting our texts. This manipulation of our scriptures is accomplished by taking passages out of context, mistranslating the words, and even making up quotes. Here are several New Testament verses together with their sources in the Tanakh. Let's examine how honestly specific passages are portrayed. Taking passages out of context. Example number one. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. This is from the book of Matthew, chapter two, verse 14. This New Testament story is about Joseph fleeing with his wife Mary and the baby Jesus shortly after Jesus was born. God is quoted as calling his son out of Egypt. Matthew tries to show that this event was forecasted in the Tanakh's book of Hosea hundreds of years earlier. Looking at this passage from Hosea as cited in Matthew, it might appear that Jesus could have been the son of God. But let's examine the actual text that Matthew uses as his source. Quote, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. End quote. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. We see here very clearly that Hosea was actually referring to the Jewish people collectively as God's son. This use of metaphor is common throughout the Tanakh where the Jewish people are referred to repeatedly as God's son or child. As we see in Exodus chapter four, verse 22, quote, and you shall say unto Parah, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn, end quote. Furthermore, this verse in Hosea is one of the many examples where the New Testament takes a historical event and transforms it into a messianic prophecy. Example number two, and leaving Nazareth, he, Jesus, came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, quote, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. 
This is quoted from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. This New Testament passage deals with the beginning of Jesus' ministry and lists the places he visited. Matthew wanted to show that Jesus fulfilled an alleged prophecy from Isaiah that the Messiah would also begin his ministry in these same places. Let's read that prophecy. Quote, Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory, and it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks. For there is no weariness to him, the king of Syria, who is set against her. At the first lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards he afflicted her more grievously by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the nations. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 7 and verse 23. The eighth chapter of Isaiah is really an historical account of the king of Assyria's assault on the northern kingdom of Israel, which ultimately led to his taking the ten tribes into exile. The chapter ends with a description of how he afflicted the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali and the Galilee. This clearly negates Matthew's claim that this is a messianic prophecy fulfilled by Jesus. Notice that Matthew twice eliminates the description of how the king afflicted these areas. Mistranslations. To make the Tanakh appear full of references to Jesus, Christian writers have resorted to mistranslating some critical Hebrew words. Therefore, not only should we be aware of the deception found in the New Testament, but we should also be wary of Christian translations of the Hebrew Bible. Example number three. For dogs have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked have encircled me. They pierced my hands and my feet. It's from Psalm 22, verse 17. From this Christian translation of the Hebrew Bible, it appears that this psalm speaks about someone whose hands and feet are pierced. These words could lead someone to believe that the psalm is alluding to Jesus. However, during the Roman occupation, tens of thousands of Jews were crucified. And Psalm 22, verse 17, does not identify any specific person, including Jesus. Let's take a look at a correct translation. For dogs have surrounded me, the assembly of the wicked have encircled me. Like a lion, they are at my hands and my feet. This Jewish translation of Psalm 22, verse 17, correctly renders ka'ari, the Hebrew word in question, as like a lion, and not as they pierced. King David wrote this passage to describe the travails of his life. It is not a messianic prophecy. In verse 14 and 22, David refers allegorically to those who pursue him as lions. See also Psalm chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 3. In all other places where the Hebrew word ka'ari is found in scriptures, Christian translations render it correctly as like a lion. We see this in Numbers chapter 24, verse 9, Isaiah 38, 13, and Ezekiel twenty-two twenty-five. 25. Example number four, quote, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Psalm chapter 2, verse 12. This Christian translation of Psalm 2, verse 12, creates the impression that we are to embrace the Son of God or else suffer the consequences. But let's take a look at what it really says. Quote, Embrace or worship in purity, lest he be angry and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. In this Jewish translation, the Hebrew word bar is correctly translated as purity. Christians base their rendition upon the Aramaic translation of bar, meaning son of, as in bar mitzvah. Aside from the fact that bar is not the Aramaic word for son, 
Why would this Aramaic word find its way into a psalm composed in Hebrew by King David? The context of this psalm is an admonition of the rulers of the world for their behavior. It is not a prophecy about the Messiah. Then there are made up verses. Let's take a look, example, um, from the book of Matthew, chapter two, verse 23, quote, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. The point of this passage is to show that the Messiah is to be from the city of Nazareth and be known for this by all, as Jesus of Nazareth was. Not only has there never been a requirement for the Messiah to be from Nazareth, but also the quote that Matthew cites does not appear anywhere in the Tanakh. It was made up. Furthermore, the words Nazareth and Nazarene cannot be found anywhere in the Tanakh. In fact, the town of Nazareth did not exist when the Jewish Bible was written. Other Christians try to make the connection from the description of the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 11, verse one as a Nazar or branch of Jesse, David's father. Even though the root of this word is the same, it is clearly not the same quote and shows no connection to the city of Nazareth. Another example, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. This is from the book of Matthew chapter 27, verse nine. Matthew wants us to believe that the prophet Jeremiah foretold the 30 pieces of silver that Judas received for betraying Jesus. After feeling remorse, Judas threw them into the temple before committing suicide. Jeremiah never wrote anything of the sort. The closest reference to this could be from a combination of the following two verses. And Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, your uncle shall come unto you saying, buy my field that is in Anatot, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. This is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, verses six and seven. And also, and I said unto them, if you think it good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. It's from the book of Zechariah, chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. Both these texts are historical passages that have nothing to do with describing the Messiah who would come in the future. It is important for Jews to understand that the same manipulation of scripture that we have seen in these six examples is also used for beliefs that are the foundational to Christianity. Let's now examine just two of them. The virgin birth. The virgin birth is based on this verse, quote, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is a Christian translation of Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. This is the verse upon which Christianity bases its claim that Jesus was born of a virgin. And this is essential to prove that he is the son of God. As mentioned before, stories of virgin births were common with pagan mythologies and were readily accepted by them. Such beliefs have always been totally foreign to Judaism. By now, we have seen many examples of the ways in which some Christian editors have manipulated Jewish texts, and we can understand how these verses have been doctored through mistranslating words and taking passages out of context, we again see how their beliefs have absolutely no connection to our Tanakh. Let us now look at the seventh chapter of Isaiah to see the actual context 
of the passage of the Christian virgin birth verse. Quote, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to fight against it, but could not prevail against it. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Ask it in either the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but you will weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the young woman is with child, and she will bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, when he shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread shall be deserted. This is Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. After the reign of King Solomon, the Jewish people split into two warring kingdoms, the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel, or Ephraim. King Ahaz of the kingdom of Judah was being attacked by the two armies of Aram and Israel and was panicking. To ease their fears, God offered him a sign that he and the rest of Jerusalem would be saved. The young woman, someone familiar to Ahaz, was pregnant and would give birth. The real sign was that before the child would know how to refuse the evil and choose the good, Ahaz and his kingdom would be spared of the two threatening kings. This chapter is dealing with a political crisis that took place around 700 BCE. It has nothing to do with the future Messiah of the Jewish people. What comfort would Ahaz gain from a child born 700 years later since he needed help then? Christian translators change the word hara, which means is pregnant, as, as we see in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 17, to mean shall conceive, thereby implying that Isaiah is talking about the future, not the present. Furthermore, they changed the word ha'alma, which means the young woman, to mean virgin. The biblical Hebrew for the word virgin is betula. Furthermore, if Isaiah did mean a virgin, then there would have been a virgin birth in Ahaz's day, and there is no mention anywhere of such an event occurring. The Christian emphasis of Jesus' blood atonement is based on Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, which states, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Christian missionaries will tell you that this passage affirms that it is only through a blood sacrifice that we can make atonement for our souls. However, because Jews no longer have temple sacrifices, how do we achieve atonement? The missionaries claim that such sacrifices are no longer necessary because the blood of Jesus serves as an eternal atonement if only we would believe in him. Once again, it is absolutely essential to see every passage in its full context to understand the true meaning and see the missionary's deliberate manipulation. Let's take a look at this biblical passage in context. Quote, And whoever there is of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among you, who eats any kind of blood, I will set my face against that soul who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Therefore, I said to the people of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood nor shall any stranger who sojourns among you shall eat blood. And whoever there is of the people of Israel 
or of the strangers who sojourn among you, who hunts and catches any beast or bird that may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for its life. Therefore, I said to the people of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any kind of flesh. For the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. This is from the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, 10 through 14. Clearly, this passage is about the prohibition against consuming blood and not about securing forgiveness from sins. Blood contains the life force of an animal. So when sacrifices were offered on the holy altar to atone for us, it is the blood, not the nose or the foot or the ear, it is the blood that atones. However, is a blood sacrifice the only way to achieve atonement? Not according to the Tanakh. The verse the missionaries rely on, Leviticus chapter 17, 11, says that blood can serve as an atonement, not that blood is the only means of atonement. At the end of this video series, video number five, I will address this issue in a video entitled, Is Blood Sacrifice Required for an Atonement? By now, we can clearly see that it is vital to always consider all of the Tanakh in its original language and context. The writers of the Christian scriptures had an agenda and they needed the Jewish texts to fit their requirements. Although we have not covered all of the Christian proof texts, it is fair to say that we have seen typical examples of the distortions they use to make their case. Now, we turn our attention to understanding the person of Jesus, assessing him as a prophet and as the Messiah. Did he meet these criteria?